As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. This is an adaptation of the great classic rewritten into modern English, adapted and narrated by teacher Sabina for new to English learners. Hi everyone, this is one of my favourite books and I think everyone should read it. Mind is the master power that moulds and makes, and man is mind and evermore he takes. The tool of thought and shaping what he wills brings forth a thousand joys, a thousand ills. He thinks in secret and it comes to pass. Environment is but his looking glass. Forward. This little volume, the result of meditation and experience, is not intended as an exhaustive essay on the much written upon subject of the power of thought. It is suggestive rather than explanatory, its object being to stimulate men and women to the discovery and perception of the truth that they them themselves are the makers of themselves, by virtue of the thoughts which they choose and encourage, and the mind is the master weaver, both of the inner garment of character and the outer garment of circumstance, that they may have up to now woven in ignorance and pain, so that they may now weave in enlightenment and happiness. Thought and Character The saying, as a man thinketh in his heart so is he, not only embraces the whole of a man's being, but is so inclusive that it encompasses every area and circumstance of his life. A man is literally what he thinks, his character being the complete sum of all his thoughts. As the plant grows from and could not exist without the seed, so every act of a man grows from the hidden seeds of thought, and could not have appeared without them. This applies equally to those actions called spontaneous and unpremeditated, as to those which are deliberately executed. Action is the blossom of thought, therefore joy and suffering are its fruits. In turn a man harvests the sweet and bitter fruits of his own cultivation. Thought in the mind has made us what we are. Thought was shaped and built. If a man's mind has evil thoughts, pain comes to him, like the wheels behind the ox. If one indulges in purity of thought, joy follows him, like his own shadow. Man grows by law. This is not a creation of accident. Cause and effect is absolute and undeviating, in the hidden realm of thought, as in the world of visible and material things. A noble and godlike character is not created by favour or chance, but is the result of continued effort in right thinking, the effects of long-cherished associations with godlike thoughts. An ignoble and inhumane character, by the same process, is the result of the continued protection of grovelling thoughts. Therefore man is made or unmade by himself. In the armoury of thought, he forges the weapons by which he destroys himself. He also develops the tools with which he builds for himself heavenly mansions of joy, strength and peace. By the right choice and true application of thought, man can ascend to the divine perfection, but by the abuse and wrong application of thought he may descend below the level of the beast. Between these two extremes are all the grades of character, and man is both their maker and master. Of all the beautiful ideas affecting the soul, which have been brought to light in this age, None is more, ple more pleasing or fruitful than the divine promise and confidence that this, that man, is the master of thought, the moulder of character, and the maker and shaper of his physical condition, environment, and destiny. As a master of power, intelligence, and love, he is also the lord of his own thoughts. Man holds the key to every situation, and contains within himself the ability to transform and redevelop himself into what he chooses. Man is always the master, even in his weaker and more negative state. However, in a weak and negative state, he is a foolish master, who misgoverns himself. When he begins to reflect upon this situation, and search diligently for the cause of his situation, he becomes the wise master, directing his energies with intelligence, and styling his thoughts to more fruitful conclusions. Now he becomes a conscious master. Therefore, man can only become by discovering within himself the laws of thought. This discovery is simply a matter of submission, self-analysis and experience. 
Gold and diamonds are only obtained by much searching and mining. In the same way, man can find every truth connected to himself, if he is willing to dig deep into the mine of his soul, and accept that he is the maker of his character, the moulder of his life, and the builder of his destiny. He will certainly discover, if he watches, controls, and changes his thoughts, tracking their effects upon himself, upon others, and upon his life and circumstances, linking cause and effect by patient practice and investigation, and utilizing his every experience, even to the most trivial everyday occurrence, obtaining the knowledge of himself, which is understanding, wisdom, power. Only this way will he learn the law of absolute, that he who seeketh findeth, and to him who knocketh it shall be opened. For only by patience, practice, and ceaseless persistence can a man enter the door of the temple of knowledge. Effect of Thought on Circumstances Man's mind may be compared to a garden, which may be intelligently grown or allowed to run wild, but whether cultivated or neglected it will bear fruit. If no useful seeds are planted in the garden of his mind, then an abundance of useless weed seeds will take root, and continue to produce more of their kind. Just as a gardener cultivates his plot, keeping it free from weeds, and growing the flowers and fruits which he requires, so must a man look after the garden of his mind, weeding out all the wrong, useless and impure thoughts, and instead cultivating the flowers and fruits of right, useful and pure thoughts. By following this process a man sooner or later discovers that he is the master gardener of his soul, the director of his life. He also reveals to himself the laws of thought, and begins to understand how thoughts and mind operate in the shaping of his character, circumstances and destiny. Thought and character are one, and as character can only develop through environment and circumstance, the outer situations of a person's life will always be found to blend harmoniously to his inner state. This does not mean that a man's circumstances at any given time are an indication of his entire character, but that circumstances are so closely connected to his thoughts that at any given time they will impact his growth. Every man is where he is by the power of his thoughts. The thoughts which he has built into his character have brought him there. In the organization of his life there are no elements of chance, but the result of a law which cannot falter. This is just as true of those who feel out of harmony with their surroundings as of those who are connected with them. Man is a progressive and evolving being. He is where he is to learn and grow. As he learns the spiritual lesson which circumstances present to him, it passes away and gives place to other circumstances. Man is battered by circumstances as long as he believes a creature affected by outside conditions. But when he realizes that he is a creative power, that he may command the hidden soil and seeds of his being, from which circumstances grow, he then becomes a master of himself. Every man knows, who has for any length of time practiced self-control and self-purification, circumstances grow out of thought, for he will have noticed that changes in his circumstances are in exact ratio to his altered state of mind. So true is this that when a man sincerely applies himself to remedy the defects of his mind, he makes swift and noticeable progress and passes rapidly through a succession of fortunes. The soul attracts that which it secretly believes, that which it loves, and also that which it fears. It reaches the height of its cherished aspirations. It also falls to the level of its unwritten desires. Circumstances are the means by which the soul receives these. Every thought seed sown or allowed to fall into the mind and to take root there produces its own blossoming sooner or later, into act, and bearing its own fruit of opportunity and circumstance. Good thoughts bear good fruit, bad thoughts bad fruit. The outer world of circumstance shapes the inner world of thought, and both pleasant and unpleasant external conditions are factors which create the individual. As the reaper of his own harvest, man learns both by suffering and bliss. The strongest desires, aspirations and thoughts by which man allows himself to be dominated, pursuing impure imaginings or steadfastly walking the highway of admirable activities, 
man at last arrives at the fruition and fulfilment in the outer conditions of his life. The tyranny of fate or unfortunate circumstance does not result in a man entering the poorhouse or jail, but by the path of grovelling thoughts and basic desires. Just as a pure-minded man cannot suddenly fall into crime by the stress of external forces and circumstances, on the contrary, criminal thoughts are secretly held in the heart for long periods of time until the hour of opportunity reveals its power. Circumstances does not make the man, it reveals him to himself. No situation exists where one can descend into vice, resulting in suffering, apart from malice, feelings and thoughts, or ascending into virtue and pure happiness without the continued development of virtuous aspirations. Therefore man, as the lord and master of thought, is the maker of himself, the shaper and author of his environment, revealed through his reactions to external circumstance. Even from birth the soul through every step of its pilgrimage on earth attracts the conditions which reveal its character, which are the reflections of its own purity, impurity, strengths and weakness. Men do not attract what they want but what they are. Their impulses, dreams and ambitions are opposed at every step but their inmost thoughts and desires are constantly fed foul or clean food, depending on how we feel about a situation. Our divinity is in ourselves. It is our very self. Only man chains himself. Thought and action are the jailers of his fate. They can imprison. They are also the angels of freedom. They can liberate. Man does not get what he wishes and prays for, but what he justly earns. His wishes and prayers are only gratified and answered when his wishes and prayers harmonize with his thoughts and actions. In the light of this truth, what is the meaning of fighting against circumstances? It means that a man is continually revolting against a circumstance while continually nourishing and preserving the cause of that circumstance in his heart. That cause may take the form of a conscious vice or an unconscious weakness, but whatever it is, it stubbornly retards the efforts of the possessor, and thus requires a remedy. Men are anxious to improve their circumstances, but are unwilling to improve themselves. They therefore remain chained within their circumstances. A man who does not remove himself from self-crucifixion will always accomplish self-crucifixion, or other object of his desires. This is as true of earthly as of heavenly things. Even a man whose sole object is to acquire wealth must be prepared to make great personal sacrifices before he can accomplish this objective, as we shall now see. Here is a man who is wretchedly poor. He is extremely anxious about his surroundings and that his home comfort should be improved. However, he avoids doing his work and he thinks he is justified in trying to deceive his employer on the grounds of insufficient wages. Such a man does not understand the simplest of these principles, the basis of true prosperity. He is not only unfit to rise out of his wretchedness, but is actually attracting to himself a deeper wretchedness by acting out of laziness, deception and unmanly thoughts. Here is a man who is a victim of a painful and persistent disease, as a result of gluttony. He is willing to give large sums of money to get rid of it, but he will not sacrifice his gluttonous desires. He continues to gratify his taste for rich and unlimited foods and have his health as well. Such a man is totally unfit to have health because he has not yet learned the first principles of a healthy life. Here is an employer of labor who adopts crooked measures to avoid paying the regulation wage and in the hope of making larger profits reduces the wages of his workpeople. Such a man is altogether unfit for prosperity, and when he finds himself bankrupt, both in regards to reputation and riches, same circumstances, not knowing that he is the sole author of his condition. I have introduced these three cases merely as illustrations of the truth that man is a causer, though nearly always unconsciously, of his circumstances, and that whilst aiming for a good end, he is continually frustrating his accomplishments by encouraging thoughts and desires which cannot possibly harmonize with the end. Such cases could be multiplied and varied almost indefinitely, but this is not necessary, 
as the reader can, if he does so choose, trace his thoughts in his own mind and life and see that mere external fa factors cannot simply be used as a ground for reasoning. However, circumstances are so complicated, thought is so deeply rooted and the conditions of happiness vary so vastly with individuals, that a man's entire soul condition, although it may be known to himself, cannot be judged by another from the external aspect of his life alone. A man may be honest in certain directions, yet suffer deprivations. A man may be dishonest in certain directions, yet acquire wealth. But the conclusion usually formed that one man fails because of his particular honesty and the other prospers because of his particular dishonesty is the result of superficial judgment, which assumes that the dishonest man is almost totally corrupt and the honest man almost entirely virtuous. In the light of a deeper knowledge and wider experience, such judgment is found to be flawed. The dishonest man may have some admirable virtues which the other does not possess, and the honest man obnoxious vices, which are absent in the other. The honest man reaps the good results of his honest thoughts and actions. He also brings himself the sufferings which his vices produce. The dishonest man likewise harvests his own suffering and happiness. It is pleasing and vanity to believe that one suffers because of one's virtue, and not until a man has eradicated every sickly, bitter and impure thought from his mind and washed every sinful stain from his soul, can he be in a position to know and declare that his sufferings are the result of his good and not his bad qualities. And on the way to, yet long before he reaches supreme perfection, he will find working in his mind and life the great law which is absolutely just and cannot give good for evil or evil for good. Possessed of such knowledge, he will then know, looking back upon his past ignorance and blindness, that his life is and always was justly ordered, and that all his past experiences, good and bad, were the unbiased outworkings of his developing yet uninvolved self. Good thoughts and actions can never produce bad results. Bad thoughts and actions can never produce good results. This is but saying that nothing can come from corn but corn. Nothing can come from nettles but nettles. Men understand this law in the natural world and work with it, but few understand it in the mental and moral world. Though its operation is just as simple and undeviating, yet they do not cooperate with it. Suffering is always the effect of wrong thought in some direction. It is an indication that the individual is out of harmony with himself with the law of his being. The sole and supreme use of suffering is to purify, to burn out all that is useless and impure. Suffering ceases for him who is pure. Just as it is not possible to burn gold after the rubbish has been removed, a perfectly pure and enlightened being also cannot suffer once the rubbish in his mind has been removed. The circumstances with which a man encounters suffering is the result of his own mental harmony. The circumstances with which a man encounters blessedness are the result of his own mental harmony. Blessedness, not material possessions, is the measure of right thought. Wretchedness, not lack of material possessions, is the measure of wrong thought. A man may be cursed and rich, he may be blessed and poor. Blessedness and riches are only joined together when the riches are rightly and wisely used, and the poor man only descends into wretchedness when he regards his lot as a burden unjustly imposed. Poverty and indulgence are the two extremes of wretchedness. They are both equally unnatural and the result of mental disorder. A man is not rightly conditioned until he is a happy, healthy and prosperous being. The happiness, health and prosperity are the result of a harmonious judgment of the inner with the outer, of the man with his surroundings. A man only begins to be a man when he ceases to whine and criticise, and begins to search for the hidden justice which regulates his life. And as he adapts his mind to that regulating factor, he stops accusing others as the cause of his condition, and builds himself up in strong noble thoughts. 
stops to kick against circumstances, but begins to use them as aids to his more rapid progress and as a means of discovering the hidden powers and possibilities within himself. Law not confusion is a dominating principle in the universe. Justice not injustice is the soul and the substance of life. And righteousness, not corruption, is the moulding and moving force in the spiritual government of the world. This being so, man has to put himself right to find that the universe is right. And during the process of putting himself right, as he alters his thoughts towards things and other people, things and other people will alter towards him. The proof of this truth is in every person and it therefore admits of easy investigation by systematic introspection and self-analysis. Let a man radically alter his thoughts and he will be astonished by the rapid transformation it will effect in the material conditions of his life. Men imagine that thought can be kept secret, but it cannot. It rapidly crystallizes into habit and habit solidifies into circumstance. Beastly thoughts crystallize into habits of drunkenness and pleasure which solidify into circumstances of destitution and disease. Impure thoughts of every kind crystallize into exhaustion and confusing habits, which solidify into distracting and adverse circumstances. Thoughts of fear, doubt and indecision crystallize into weak, unmanly and habits of hesitation, which solidify into circumstances of failure, destitution and unquestioning dependence. Lazy thoughts crystallize into habits of uncleanliness and dishonesty, which solid into circumstances of foulness and beggary. Hateful and condemnatory thoughts crystallize into habits of accusation and violence, which solidify into circumstances of injury and persecution. Selfish thoughts of all kinds crystallize into habits of self-seeking, which solidify into circumstances more or less dis distressing. On the other hand, beautiful thoughts of all kinds crystallize into habits of grace and kindliness, which solidify into hospitality and sunny circumstances. Pure thoughts crystallize into habits of temperance and self-control, which solidifies into circumstances of relaxation and peace. Thoughts of courage, self-reliance and decision crystallize into manly habits, which solidify into circumstances of success, plenty and freedom. Energetic thoughts crystallize into habits of cleanliness and industry, which solidify into circumstances of pleasantness. Gentle and forgiving thoughts crystallize into habits of gentleness, which solidify into protective and preservative circumstances. Loving and unselfish thoughts crystallize into habits of selflessness, which solidify into circumstances of sure and abiding prosperity and true riches. A particular train of thought persisted in, be it good or bad, cannot fail to produce its results on the character and circumstances. A man cannot directly choose his circumstances, but he can choose his thoughts, so indirectly shape his circumstances. Nature helps every man to the fulfilment of the thoughts he, he most encourages. Opportunities are then presented, which will most quickly bring to the surface both good or evil thoughts. If a man ceases his sinful thought, all the world will soften towards him and be ready to help him. If he puts away his weakly and sickly thoughts, opportunities will spring up every hand to aid his strong resolve. If he encourages good thoughts, no hard fate shall bind him to wretchedness and shame. The world is your kaleidoscope, and the varying combination of colours at every moment present exquisitely adjusted pictures of your ever-moving thoughts. So you will be what you will be, let failure find its false content in the environment. But spirit scorns it and is free. It masters time, it conquers space, it twists that boastful trickster, chance, and bids the tyrant circumstance. And crown and fill its servant's place, the human will, that force unseen, the offspring of a deathless soul, can hew a way to any goal. The walls of granite intervene, be not impatient in delays, but wait as one who understands, when spirit rises and commands, the gods are ready to obey. Effect of thought on health and the body. The body is a servant of the mind, 
It obeys the operations of the mind, whether they be deliberately chosen or automatically expressed. At the request of unlawful thoughts, the body sinks rapidly into disease and decay. At the command of glad and beautiful thoughts, it becomes clothed with youthfulness and beauty. Disease and health-like circumstances are rooted in thought. Sickly thoughts will express themselves through a sickly body. Thoughts of fear have been known to kill a man as speedily as a bullet, and they are continually killing thousands of people today, just as surely though less rapidly. The people who live in fear of disease are the people who get it. Anxiety quickly demoralizes the whole body and lays it open to the entrance of disease, while impure thoughts, even if not physically indulged, will soon shatter the nervous system. Strong, pure and happy thoughts build up the body in vigor and grace. The body is a delicate and plastic instrument which responds rapidly to the thoughts by which it is impressed and the habits of thought will produce their own effects, good or bad, upon it. Men will continue to have impure, impure and poisoned blood so long as they propagate unclean thoughts. Out of a clean heart comes a clean life and a clean body. Out of a defiled mind proceeds a defiled life and a corrupt body. Thought is a fountain of action, life and manifestation. Make the fountain pure, and all will be pure. Change of diet will not help a man who will not change his thoughts. When a man makes his thoughts pure, he no longer desires impure food. Clean thoughts make clean habits. The so-called saint who does not wash his body is not a saint. He who has strengthened and purified his does not need to worry about the malevolent germ. If you want to protect your body, protect your mind. If you want to renew your body, beautify your mind. Thoughts of malice, envy, disappointment, hopelessness rob the body of its health and grace. A sour face does not come by chance. It is made by sour thoughts. Wrinkles that disfigure appear through foolishness, passion and pride. I know a woman of 96 who has the bright innocent face of a girl. I know a man well under middle age whose face is drawn into inharmonious contours. The one is the result of a sweet and sunny disposition, and the other the outcome of passion and discontent. As you cannot have a sweet and wholesome home unless you admit the air and sunshine freely into your rooms, so a strong body and a bright, happy or serene expression can only come from the entrance of joyous goodwill and serenity thoughts into the mind. On the faces of the aged there are wrinkles made by sympathy others by strong and pure thought, and others are carved by passion, who cannot distinguish them. With those who have lived righteously, age is calm, peaceful and softly mellowed, like the setting sun. I have recently seen a philosopher on his deathbed. He was not old except in years. He died as sweetly and peacefully as he had lived. There is no medicine, like cheerful thought, for disintegrating the ills of the body, there is no comforter like good will for dispersing the shadows of grief and sorrow. To live continually in thoughts of ill will, cynicism, suspicion and envy is to be confined in a self-made prison hole. But to think well of all, to be cheerful with all, to patiently learn to find the good in all, such unselfish thoughts are the very portals of heaven, and to dwell day by day in thoughts of peace towards every creature will bring abounding peace to the possessor. Thought and Purpose Until thought is linked with purpose, there is no intelligent accomplishment. Most people simply allow their thoughts to drift upon the ocean of life. Aimlessness is a vice, and such drifting must cease, if a man is to steer clear of catastrophe and destruction. He who has no central purpose in his life will become easy prey to petty worries, fears, troubles and self-pityings, all of which are indications of weakness, which, which lead just as surely as deliberately planned sins, though by a different route, to failure, unhappiness and loss, for weakness cannot persist in a power-evolving universe. Therefore, a man should conceive a genuine purpose in his heart and set out to accomplish it, 
he should make his purpose the central point of his thoughts. It may take the form of a spiritual ideal, or it may be a worldly objective, according to his nature at the time of being, but whichever it is, he should steadily focus his thoughts upon the objective which he has set before him. He should make his purpose his highest duty and devote himself to its attainment, not allowing his thoughts to wander away into fleeting fancies, longings and imaginings. This is the royal road to self-control and self-concentration of thought. Even if he fails again and again to accomplish his purpose, as he necessarily must until weakness is overcome, the strength of character gained will be the measure of his true success, and this will form a new starting point for future power and triumph. Those who are not prepared for the challenges of a great purpose should fix their thoughts on the faultless performance of their duty, no matter how insignificant their task may appear. Only in this way can the thoughts be gathered and focused, and resolution and energy be developed, which being done, there is nothing which may not be accomplished. Even the weakest soul, knowing his own weakness, and believing that strength can only be developed by effort and patience, will at once begin to exert itself, and add effort to effort, patience to patience, and strength to strength, will never cease to develop and will at last grow divinely strong. As the physically weak man can make himself strong by careful and patient training, so the man of weak thoughts can make himself strong by exercising himself in right thinking. To put away aimlessness and weakness and to begin to think with purpose is to enter the ranks of the strong, who only recognize failure as one of the pathways to attainment, who make all conditions, good or bad, serve them, to think strongly, attempt fearlessly, and accomplish masterfully. Having conceived this purpose, man should mentally mark out a straight path to his achievement, looking neither to the right nor the left. Doubts and fears should be rigorously excluded. They are disintegrating elements, which break up the straight line of effort, rendering it crooked, ineffectual, useless. Thoughts of doubt and fear never accomplished anything and never can. They always lead to failure. Purpose, energy, power to do, and all strong thoughts stop when doubt and fear creep in. The will to do springs from the knowledge that we can do. Doubt and fear are the great enemies of knowledge. And he who encourages them, who does not slay them, disadvantages himself at every step. He who conquers doubt and fear conquers failure. His every thought is associated with power, and all difficulties bravely met and wisely overcome. His purposes are seasonably planted, and they bloom and bring forth fruit, which does not fall prematurely to the ground. Thought associated fearlessly to purpose becomes a creative force. He who knows this is ready to become something higher and stronger than a mere bundle of wavering thoughts and emotions. He who does this has become the conscious and intelligent wielder of his own mental powers. The Thought Factor in Achievement All that a man achieves and all that he fails to achieve is the direct result of his own thoughts. In a justly ordered universe where loss of balance would mean total destruction, individual responsibility must be absolute. A man's man's weakness and strength, purity and impurity are his own, and not another man's. They are brought about by himself, and not by another, and they can only be altered by himself, never by another. His condition is also his own, and not another man's. His suffering and his happiness are evolved in. As he thinks, so he is. As he continues to think, so he remains. A strong man cannot help a weaker unless the weaker is willing to be helped, and even then the weak man must become strong himself. He must by his own efforts develop the strength which he admires in another. None but himself can alter his condition or situation. It has been usual for men to think and to say, many men are slaves because one is an oppressor. Let us hate the oppressor. 
Now, however, there is amongst an increasing few a tendency to reverse this judgment and say, one man is an oppressor because many are slaves. Let us despise the slaves. The truth is that oppressor and slave are co-operators in ignorance and while seeming to afflict each other are in reality afflicting themselves. The perfect knowledge observes the action of law, the weakness of the oppress and the misapplied power of the oppressor, a perfect love seeing the suffering which both positions demand, condemns neither, a perfect compassion embraces both oppressor and oppressed. He who has conquered weakness and has put away all self-thoughts belongs neither to oppressor nor oppressed, he is free. A man can only rise, conquer and achieve by lifting up his thoughts. He can only remain weak, hopeless and miserable by refusing to lift up his thoughts. Before a man can achieve anything, even in worldly things, he must lift his thoughts above unquestioning animal indulgence. He may not, in order to succeed, give up all cruelty and selfishness by any means, but a portion of it must at least be sacrificed. A man whose first thought is cruel indulgence can neither think clearly nor plan methodically. As he cannot find and develop his latent resources, hence would fa fail in any undertaking. Not having commenced to manfully control his thoughts, he is not in a position to control affairs and adopt serious responsibilities. He is not fit to act independently and stand alone, but he is limited only by the thoughts which he chooses. There can be no progress, no achievement without sacrifice. A man's worldly success will be the measure of the sacrifices he is made against confused animal thoughts and ability to fix his mind on the development of his plans, the strengthening of his resolution and self-reliance. The higher he lifts his thoughts, the more manly, upright and righteous he becomes, and greater will be his success, the more blessed and enduring will be his achievements. The universe does not favour the greedy, the dishonest, the vicious, although, on the mere surface, it may sometimes appear to do so. In contrast, it helps the honest, the magnanimous, the virtuous, all the great teachers of the ages have declared this in varying forms. But to prove and know it, a man has to persist in making himself more and more virtuous by lifting up his thoughts. Intellectual achievements are the result of thoughts consecrated to the search for knowledge, or for the beautiful and true in life and nature. While such achievements may sometimes be connected to vanity and ambition, they are in truth not the outcome of those characteristics. They are the natural outgrowth of long and arduous effort and of pure and unselfish thoughts. Spiritual achievements are the consummation of holy aspirations, he who lives constantly in the conception of noble and lofty thoughts, who dwells upon all that is pure and unselfish, will, as surely as the sun reaches its zenith and the moon its full, become wise and noble in character, and rise into a position of influence and blessedness. Achievement of whatever kind is the crown of effort, the crown of thought. By the aid of self-control, resolution, purity, righteousness and well-directed thought, a man rises by the aid of cruelty, laziness, impurity, corruption and confusion of thought, a man falls. A man may rise to high success in the world and even to lofty altitudes in the spiritual realm and fall again into weakness and wretchedness by allowing arrogant, selfish and corrupt thoughts to take possession of him. Victories attained by right thought can only be maintained by watchfulness. Many give way when success is assured and rapidly fall back into failure. All achievements, whether in the business, intellectual or spiritual world, are the result of definitely directed thought. They are governed by the same law and are of the same method. The only difference is the object of attainment. He who plans to accomplish little will sacrifice little. He who aims to achieve much must sacrifice much. He who aims to attain highly must sacrifice greatly. Visions and Ideals The dreamers are the saviours of the world. 
as the visible world is sustained by the invisible, so men, through all their trials and sins and sordid vocations, are nourished by the beautiful visions of their solitary dreamers. Humanity cannot forget its dreamers. It cannot let their ideals fade and die. It lives in them, it knows them, as the realities which it shall one day see and know. Composers, sculptors, painters, poets, prophets, sage, these are the makers of the afterworld, the architects of heaven. The world is beautiful because lived. Without them labouring, humanity would perish. He who cherishes a beautiful vision, a lofty ideal in his heart, will one day realise it. Columbus cherished a vision of another world, and he discovered it. Copernicus fostered the vision of a multiplicity of worlds and wider uni universe, and he revealed it. Buddha beheld the vision of a spiritual world of stainless beauty and perfect peace, and he entered into it. Cherish your visions, cherish your ideals, cherish the music that stirs in your heart, the beauty that forms in your mind, the loveliness that drapes your purest thoughts. For out of them will grow all beautiful conditions, all heavenly environment. Of these, if you but remain true to them, your world will at last be built. To desire is to obtain, to aspire is to achieve. Will man's basic desires receive the fullest measure of gratification, and his purest aspirations starve for lack of nourishment? This is not the law. Ask and receive. Dream supreme dreams, and as you dream, so shall you become. Your vision is the promise of what you shall one day be. Your ideal is a prophecy of what you shall at last unveil. The greatest achievement was at first and for a time a dream. The oak sleeps in the acorn, the bird waits in the egg, and in the highest vision of the soul a waking angel stirs. Dreams are the seedlings of realities. Your circumstances may be unpleasant, but they shall not remain long if you perceive an ideal and strive to reach it. You cannot both travel within and stand still without. Out. Here is a youth hard-pressed by poverty and labour, confined long hours in an unhealthy workshop, unschooled and lacking all the arts of refinement. But he dreams of better things. He thinks of intelligence, of refinement, of grace and beauty. He conceives and mentally builds up an ideal condition of life. The vision of a wider liberty and a larger scope takes possession of him. Unrest urges him to action, and he utilises all his spare time and means, small though they are, to the development of his latent powers and resources. Very soon, so altered has his mind become, the workshop can no longer hold him. He has become so out of harmony with his mentality that it falls out of his life like a garment is cast aside, and with the growth of opportunities which fit the scope of his expanding powers he passes out of it forever. Years later we see this youth as a fully grown man, find him a master of his mind. He wields with worldwide influence and almost unequalled power. In his hand he holds the cords of gigantic responsibilities. He speaks and lives are changed. Men and women hang upon his words and remould their characters. And sun-like he becomes the thick and luminous centre around which innumerable destinies revolve. He has realised the vision of his youth. He has become one with his ideal. And you too, youthful reader, will realise the vision, not the idle wish of your heart, be it basic or beautiful or a mixture of both, for you will always gravitate towards that which you secretly most love. Into your hands will be placed the exact results of your own thoughts. You will receive that, that which you earn, no more, no less. Whatever your present environment may be, you will fall, remain, or rise with your thoughts, your vision, your ideal. You will become as small as your controlling desire, as great as your dominant aspiration, in the beautiful words of Stan Kirkham Davis. You may be keeping accounts, and presently you shall walk out of the door that for so long has seemed to you the barrier of your ideals, and shall find yourself before an audience the pen still behind your ear, the ink stains on your fingers, and then there shall pour out the torrent of your inspiration. You may be driving sheep, and you shall wander to the city bucolic and open-mouthed, 
shall wander under the intrepid guidance of the Spirit into the studio of the Master, and after a time he shall say, I have nothing more to teach you, and now you have become the Master, who did so recently dream of great things while driving sheep. You shall lay down the saw and the plane to take upon yourself the regeneration of the world. The thoughtless, the ignorant and the lazy, seeing only the apparent effects of things and not the things themselves, talk of luck, of fortune and chance. Seeing a man grow rich, they say, how lucky he is. Observing another become intellectual, they claim, how highly favoured he is. And noting the saintly character and wide influence of another, they remark, how chance aids him at every turn. They do not see the trials and failures and struggles which these men have voluntarily encountered in order to gain their experience, have no knowledge of the sacrifices they have made, of the undaunted efforts they have put forth, or the faith they have exercised, that they might overcome the apparently insurmountable and realise the vision of their heart. They do not know the darkness and the heartaches, they only see the light and joy and call it luck. They do not see the long and arduous journey, but only behold the pleasant goal and call it good fortune. They do not understand the process, but only perceive the result and call it chance. In human affairs there are efforts, and there are results, and the strength of the effort is the measure of the result. Chance is not. Gifts, powers, material, intellectual, and spiritual possessions are the fruits of effort. They are thoughts completed, objects accomplished, visions realized. The vision that you glorify in your mind, the ideal that you enthrone in your heart, this you will build your life by, this you will become. Serenity Calmness of the mind is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom. It is the result of love and patient effort in self-control. Its patience is an indication of ripened experience and of a more than ordinary knowledge of the laws and operations of thought. A man becomes calm in the measure that he understands himself. As a thought-evolved being, for such knowledge demands the understanding of others. As the result of thought, and as he develops a right understanding, and sees more and more clearly the internal relations of things by the action of cause and effect, he stops fussing and fuming, worrying and grieving, and remains poised, steadfast and serene. A calm man, having learned how to govern himself, knows how to adapt himself to others, and they, in turn, reverence his spiritual strength, and feel that they can learn from him and rely upon him. The more tranquil a man becomes, the greater is his success, his influence, his power for good. Even the ordinary trader will find his business prosperity increase as he develops a greater self-control and composure for people will always prefer to deal with a man whose manner is mostly calm. A strong, calm man is always loved and revered. He is like the shade-giving tree in a thirsty land, or a sheltering rock in a storm. Who does not love a tranquil heart, a sweet-tempered, balanced life? It does not matter whether it rains or shines, or what changes come to those possessing these blessings, for they are always sweet, serene, and calm. That exquisite poise of character which we call serenity, is the last lesson of culture, the fruit of the soul. It is precious as wisdom. More to be desired than gold, yes, than even fine gold. How insignificant mere money-seeking looks in comparison with a serene life. A life that dwells in the ocean of truth, beneath the waves beyond the reach of tempests, in the eternal calm. How many people we know, who sour their lives, who ruin all that is sweet and beautiful by explosive tempers, who destroy their poise of character and make bad blood. The great majority of people ruin their lives and ruin their happiness simply by a lack of self-control. Few people we meet in life are well balanced, who have the exquisite poise which is characteristic of the finished character. Yes, humanity surges with uncontrolled passion is tumultuous with ungoverned grief, is blown about by anxiety and doubt. Only the wise man, only he whose thoughts are controlled and purified, makes the winds and the storm of the soul obey him. Storm-tossed souls, wherever you may be, 
under whatever conditions you may live, know this. In the ocean of life, the isles of blessedness are smiling, and the sunny shore of your ideal awaits your coming. Keep your hand firmly upon the wheel of thought. In the back of your soul reclines the commanding master. He is simply asleep. Wake him. Self-control is strength. Right thought is mastery. Calmness is power. Say to your heart, peace, be still.